in this corner with tea. Today we have Member of Legislative Assembly Laurie Sigurdsson, Emily for Edmonton Riverview, um, a critic for seniors and housing. Emily Sigurdsson is also a social worker and a very proud parent. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for doing this. Yes, thank you for asking me, dear. Um, I followed you, I follow you on social media and it feels to me I already know you, but we met just 10 minutes ago. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what is that thing that your constituents don't know about you? What would endear you to them? Well, I'm not sure. I, uh, I think some of them probably do know, it about, know about me, and maybe some don't. And so perhaps uh, I think the most important thing is how much I believe in inclusion. Hmm. And that uh, certainly as an elected official, I want to make sure that everyone benefits from government programs and that all Albertans are supported. I mean, that really motivated me to run early on because I just felt that Alberta was really uh, catering to a, more of an elite population and that many people many people, myself included, my family included, were not benefiting from the so-called Alberta Advantage, certainly the populations that I've served. And so I was like, that's not fair, and we need to make sure that all uh, Albertans are included. And uh, so I think that, that sort of is the underpinning of uh, the work that I do. That's beautiful inclusion. All right, it was Father's Day on Sunday. Yes, it was Sunday. I saw a photo you took with your dad. What is, um, how has he shaped your worldview? Ah, okay, so so my dad's 90, so I just want to say that. And, uh, You're not 90. Your Pardon? dad is. My dad is 90. Yes, yes, that's right. And uh, I'm almost 60. I'm 58, so I'm, I'm, uh, I'm getting up there. But uh, my dad... Uh, I grew up in a very small town in the Peace River country, and it was like 1,200 people. Mm. And we were kind of outsiders. We came to that community because my dad wanted to start a small business in a, in a small community, because he's a journeyman sheet metal, and my mom was a school teacher, All right. and she wanted to work, and so she got a job at a school, and dad opened a small business. Yeah. And uh, so we were kind of outsiders. We were, um, you know, we didn't know anybody in that small community. And uh, so, you know, it was a little, it was difficult. I was in grade two, I guess, when we moved there. I was born in Winnipeg. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm, okay. I have a Icelandic background. Sigurdsson is Icelandic. And so, Manitoba, I was born in Winnipeg. But still, when I was very young, I moved to Alberta. And um, I think one of the things about my parents, I want to include my mother, is just they both were sort of uh, people who had a lot of hope and I think courage. And I think that they had some challenges in manifestation. Like, I, I, Dad had aspirations for politics, for mm, sure. Okay. But he could not manifest it. He used to sometimes talk just like, you could be prime minister. He would say things like that to us. But in terms of his own life, he, he really struggled actually to have that kind of leadership or success in that way. You know, he was a shy man, and uh, so that was hard. But he always sort of had that hope for, or he is, he was a, he, he is, he's, I don't want to talk about past tense, he is a dreamer. You know, he was like, things can be different, they can be better. So those are some of the things that I he heard. He you sowed in, in your heart. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. So is your father of you? You've done pretty much everything he may want to do, he may have wanted to do. I, I think so. I think so. My my dad is, um, I would say, very understated. So he doesn't go, oh, I'm so proud of you, Lori. Mom would say that to me. I'm very proud of you, Lori. And I know she is. Uh, and I know dad is, too. It's just he's kind of more huh. subdued in his personality. I hope they're proud of me. Well, I'm sure. I'm sure they are. So in terms of what lessons is um, is taught you that you pass on to your children? What is the one distinctive um, seed you passed on or you're passing on to your children? See anything? Uh, I think sort of already I've spoken a little bit about sort of, you know, my parents are really pioneers mm -hmm. and they were great. You have to be, have lots of courage to be a pioneer, to be able to go somewhere where you don't know anybody. 
I come to come to Alberta and not know people. So I think that well, my children, I have three sons, that they see in me also that quality that I'm willing to sort of sometimes go in harm's way because of my belief system, what I, what I stand for, my values. Mm -hmm. So I think that, uh, um, you know, uh, I think deep courage and also really, you know, being your own authority not letting someone else tell you. Yeah, an element of self-confidence and yeah. self-belief as well. Yeah. I mean, this is your office and you've done so well as a woman, as a mom. And what are some of the challenges you face just getting here? Oh, <laughs> well, it might be beyond the 20 minutes <laughs> that we have together. Um, and I'm not only a mom, I'm a single mom, you know. Okay. I've, uh, okay. I've uh, been a single mom for well, really, most of my children's life. But my youngest son is 17. He graduated. He did. He just graduated from grade 12. Week. We're very excited. Yay, yeah. Wade. And, uh, and then I have a, a, a son who's 20. Yeah. And he's uh, working on being a personal trainer. That's what it's, He's sort of a bit of a, a jock <laughs> and an athlete. And uh, uh, then I have an older son who's... Uh, 32 actually, okay. and he's married and has his own small business, and uh, uh, he's doing very well. So, um, certainly when Maxwell, that's my oldest son, I was uh, 26 when he was born, and um, you know, then I had I had a BA in political science, and I was working in the nonprofit sector, making you know poverty wages. Uh, you know, struggling. So I mean, certainly financially, it was it was hard. We didn't have a vehicle, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and uh, um, you know, it was. Uh, I had to be very careful always about things. But I I sort of got to a place where I knew that if I continued in this way, that I would just uh, you know be bitter, you know, because mm -hmm. I'm working in, with such a low income, I just couldn't do anything, children. and I couldn't support my youngest, my oldest son, sorry, yeah. um, and so then I thought, okay, and here's the courage part, I decided I had to go back to university, and I really, for the 10 years between my Bachelor of Arts degree and getting my uh, Master's in Social Work, like that period before I went back to school, I worked sort of in the social services field, and I knew that that was the profession I needed to make a difference and to have uh, my contributions acknowledged. And so, you know, with really very little support, I went back to university in my late 20s, early 30s. And I mean, that was a huge risk, you know, for me and my, my little boy at the time. But that's the thing, it, you know, and I'll just draw it back to my parents, just uh, being pioneers or going in a certain way, uh, having the courage to do that. So uh, I knew that I needed to change my life in order for me to, to be able to care for, care for my son and also contribute, which is what I wanted to do uh, in my career. So, uh, so you know, um, having a, a son when I wasn't in a relationship, like it was an unplanned pregnancy, and uh, that really sort of, you know, threw things off. But now I know having Maxwell was actually such a tremendous gift because mm -hmm. it actually gave me purpose and it made me important. And I think a lot of times uh, I didn't feel important, mm -hmm. but I knew I was important because I was Maxwell's mom. <laughs> right. and, and so he, that just sort of helped move right. me in areas where I probably wouldn't have gone previously. And so I moved on to... Uh, you know, get a master's degree, and that really opened tremendous so that was doors for me. your career. All right. Yeah. Well, I mean, I was okay. working all the time along, but it was, um, you know, in lower level positions, and I just knew that I, there was more that I had to offer. I just I wanted to develop myself too and understand. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. Oh. So that that's I mean that's uh, the first part of it, but I mean. You know, I did. I did eventually marry in my mid thirties. Had two more children. I, I I make the joke that I had my own grandchildren because I was thirty seven and forty <laughs> when my two youngest were born, and mm. uh, you know, it, and my marriage lasted about nine years, mm. and uh, then it ended, and that was uh, you know devastating for me. And um, you know, I just had to do a lot of work, a lot of 
spiritual work, I really think, to overcome some of those challenges, and then to support my family, you know, financially, emotionally, socially. So there was, there was a lot of barriers. And of course, this is all in a time where women aren't really, um, in the workforce, they're not really supposed to bring any of their family needs in. Like, you can't say, oh, my son's sick. Uh, so I can't come to work today. You know, mm -hmm. that was very frowned upon. Mm -hmm. Or when I got my master's, uh, I said, okay, there's no program at Edmonton, and University of Calgary had a program, and so I said, I want to do my placement in Edmonton because my family's here. And they said to me, no, you, you can't uh, make it about family. You can't make it that you're a single mom. You know, this is over 20 years ago. <laughs> And uh, it's about, uh, you have to do it something to do with, to do with uh, your academic training. Whereas nowadays, women can yeah. claim that it's so yeah. heartening to see yeah. the young MLAs who have had children while in office and how much they're accommodated and supported. I'm just, it's just a world I do <laughs> live in. And I'm so wow. grateful that wow. things have shifted wow. for young women with, with yeah. young children. Oh, thank you so much for that. You survived um, leukemia. Can we talk about that journey? Yes. Well, that's it's, it's that's not so over. Me, you, you're a survivor. <laughs> you know the the title. We did a little fly. I don't know if you saw it. We called it overcoming life. And I'm talking to you. It's life, isn't it? You're an overcomer. You keep overcoming, overcoming. Yeah. You yeah. Overcome the barriers. <laughs> yes. No, I think I have. I think I am a survivor. And, uh, uh, you know, one of the things that I've always been so grateful for all my life is I've had really, a, you know, robust health. I've had, I've been super healthy all my life. Amen. Lots of energy. You know, I've been very grateful for that. And then last year, yeah. you know, probably around Christmas and then into the, you know, uh, beginning of 2018, I was just tired all the time. I just couldn't understand that. I was tired all the time and it didn't matter how much I slept. And of course I have I was Minister of Seniors and Housing at the time. Very busy so I had a very busy schedule. And so I just kept thinking, Wow, well, you know, maybe I'm getting burnt out. You know, <laughs> I'm working so much mm -hmm. and things like that. But even when I said to my staff, Okay, I need to take this whole weekend, I'm just gonna I would wake up Monday morning and I'd still tired. feel I was not rejuvenated at all. And so uh, it was now getting, it was getting, I was getting sicker as time went on, but because of the, I don't know, life experience I've had, I've not really ever been sick, you know, significantly like yeah, this. Yeah. I kept on minimizing it and just soldiering on and getting up and, you know, just and like... do what you need to do. Yeah, and just like last night, we're in the house, I was in the house till 5.30 a.m., we're in the house till midnight or whatever, all the time when I had, you know, yeah. leukemia, but I hadn't had a diagnosis yet. And I had been to the doctor, but, you know, they just, mm -hmm. it was just sort of thought, well, it's just you're, you know, a little bit tired. Like, we were all minimizing it. And then uh, one day, my middle son, this is the fellow who's the jock, he um, said to me, okay, mom, you need to go back to the doctor and tell them you've got leukemia. He diagnosed me because he could see I had some bruising and I was having bloody noses sometimes, which was weird. I don't know, but I just was in my own head. I couldn't see that very clearly. Mm -hmm. And so he got kind of angry at me, actually. And he said, you go back and you make sure they support you. Mm -hmm. So I thought, okay. So I think it was still four more days by the time my schedule could be set up so that I could go and my doctor was available. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I just said to her, I said, you know, my son thinks I've got leukemia and she said well let's get some blood work done so I went got blood work done the next morning she calls me at 7 a.m. and I'm laying in bed super tired and I think who's calling me I can hear my phone you know it's just on vibrate but it's under and she's calling me and calling me and I'm ignoring it <laughs> and then finally I picked it up and there she is in a panic and she says you go to emergency right, right now. now she says, I think you have leukemia and you've got four platelets so it was very serious, and so that same son, I went and woke him up and said, take me to the emergency, and he did. And, you know, that weekend was kind of touch and go. They didn't know if I was going to make it. But thankfully, uh, I was able to respond very well to the chemotherapy and the treatment and, you know, our amazing health system, the doctors and nurses and all the people who supported 
and uh, you know just the amazing support from everyone and just my my beautiful family and my colleagues so I uh, but it's been a journey and I just finished chemotherapy at the end of February so it's not been very long mm -hmm. and I, I'm not I, you know one of the other amazing things is I have a type of leukemia that is curable and the thing about it is it's a kind that is um, extremely aggressive so it makes you sick quite quickly and uh, as long as you're diagnosed then the treatment is very effective right. so we were just on the edge yeah. of that so I'm so grateful I was yeah. diagnosed I'm so yeah. grateful to my son Carl for, mm -hmm. for getting mad at me that day and uh, and then it was quite a journey. I mean, I did have to take some time because I was in the hospital for, you know, about a month and a half. How do you feel now? I feel great, actually. I feel much better. I just saw my doctor yesterday. Yeah. And he said, I'm doing very well. They don't say you're cured until, like, two years after uh, the last chemo treatment, which was the end of February, as I yeah. said. So they monitor me. I have, uh, you know, blood work. I mean, they're 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 continue to follow me to make sure they'll be okay but I, my energy's back you know and uh, you know I feel you're a survivor when I give you yes. a hug <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you so much thank you you're yeah, overcome it and congratulations and we there's a wall of, um, of prayers I know it's so well lovely wishes and there is um, do you want to talk to us about this yes yeah. uh, one of the pages, and I think she she got some of the pages to help her. The pages are uh, young uh, students that work in the assembly, and they pass notes and give us water and just oh. generally help us with all sorts of things, us MLAs. Yeah. And uh, so oh. she had read a story. There's a famous story about a Japanese little girl with leukemia. Yeah. And so what you know people around her did was they made these origami cranes and uh, if they made a thousand then that would create tremendous merit and then she would live and so they assembled it's, I mean, all the yes, prayers yeah yes. so she took it upon herself to do all this so it's so beautiful and I wanted to display it so I've kind of got it in this huge vase would you want me to take one out yeah okay see it yeah it's a little crane that they just fold with paper this called origami they're very beautiful. They're very beautiful. Yeah. Okay. I think we can go back. I don't know how to do it. <laughs> you, you, you want to hold on to one? Sure. There's a wall of prayers as well, constant, like a cycle of prayers. I think all the good wishes are like a pink one. <laughs> yeah, and as I was saying, this is this uh, yeah. quilt that my colleagues wrote uh, really, um, you know, supportive messages on when I was in the hospital just to uh, support me through this tough time. My thoughts are with you. Oh, that's so touching. Keep cancers as you're going to get <laughs> Yeah. So and I, I've been so Thank grateful you. to everybody. Yeah. And you're here now. I am. I'm telling I am. this story. Yes. You're going to write a book. <laughs> <laughs> I just know it. You're going to write a book. Because this is so, oops, sorry, this is so special. Okay, we have just, I think, a couple more questions. And some people, what you've described for us in, in this moving way, some people find it hard to talk about their journey, and maybe for different cultural reasons. Mm -hmm. um, Africans and South Asians, you know, they, we, we keep our medical problems to ourselves. We don't want anyone to know. What can you say to women who maybe need to, to let everyone know so they get more support one or that um, we can we can maybe influence if we advocate together? Absolutely. Well, I mean, I think probably the saddest thing is if you are, you know, alone in the struggle. And if you don't share that, you will continue to be alone. That's right. But if you do share it, then you know someone else has a story, and you know your sharing gives someone else permission to actually share also. And then you know there's great healing when two people join together. There is, and you know days. two or more when they're gathered together uh, can make a big difference. And I don't think I think that's what uh, is is very much meant in our 
you know, as human beings, we're not meant to be by ourselves. We're social creatures. And especially when we're challenged by something significant, like a health issue. Like, I know I just was not thinking clearly at that time. If my son hadn't, you know, he's a, he was a teenager, you know, mm. and he was, you know, busy doing his other stuff. But he paid attention to his old mom. <laughs> and he just went, Mom, you have to do this. He was paying attention. You know, and, and this I'm, was you. That was you then caring for everybody else but yourself. Yeah, and I had this big job. <laughs> I had all these things to do. So uh, I'm so grateful to him, and I just uh, yeah. know that you know the support of my colleagues, the NDP MLAs, and uh, certainly constituents and you know stakeholders and seniors in housing, friends, colleagues, uh, the staff and mm -hmm. seniors in housing. Mm -hmm. You know, it just was tremendous outpouring of, of uh, support, and like as I said, the pages. Mm -hmm. It was very sweet of okay. them all. So. Um, what role did faith play? Are you a woman of faith by any chance? Did yes, faith I would say that. <laughs> did faith play any role in, in your recovery? Well, I really, I think that, uh, you know, I always believe that, you know, everything is comes to us for some reason, right? And, um, mm. and so what do I need to learn from this? Mm. And that, you know, really to accepting to accept what is. Like, I don't think I spent very much time going, why is this happening to me? Okay. You know, I really felt like, okay, this is happening to me. After I realized it was happening to me, I think I denied it for a while because I didn't have any idea. But when I uh, knew it was happening to me, I accepted pretty quickly. And I think that that made the journey easier. Right. You know, I wasn't sort of uh, fighting with it. And you know, having that kind of struggle. So acceptance yeah, led to exactly uh, acceptance. And then I think the point that you made uh, earlier, or the question that you gave me about, you know, sometimes people feel uncomfortable sharing. I think that um, some people feel uncomfortable sharing, uh, you know, if they have a health issue and things like that. But in my experience, I felt that as I have shared, then people are right there to support you. Mm. You know, and so. Uh, and I think as human beings we're meant to be connected, so that has really helped me tremendously. During that season, did you have a bucket list of things you wanted to do mm. if you recovered? Not really. I mean, okay. that's, that's touching me though. Mm. Because I feel like what I just knew was the most important. It wasn't so much doing things, it was being with people. You know, mm -hmm. being connected, being aware. And I can remember when I was really sick. Mm -hmm. And my boys, my they were like, I guess they were 16, 15 actually, 15 and 19 at the time. And so I'm not there, I'm a single mom, so what are we going to do? So their dad did come and stay at my home for a while. My sister, who was an amazing gal, she lives in Kelowna, she came and lived with them for a while, so that helped. I mean, they're big boys, but... You know, yeah, it was exactly. it was a tough time yeah. for them, yeah. Yeah. and I can remember sort of feeling not very useful because I all I could do was sleep and take medication and be tired, and I just you know I'm used to sort of doing a lot of things. Yeah, yeah. So that was an adjustment for me. But there was a turning point when like you know my youngest son would come and tell me about high school stuff that was going on, like oh this is going on, mom, and then I just sort of realized hey, I can be of assistance because I can hear his stories and I can sort of be reflective with him mm -hmm. and then he can go away with a little bit of a, a lighter spirit because, mm -hmm. you know, he may have been feeling upset mm -hmm. or worried about something. So I felt like, oh, I can still do things. So I realized just my, even though I couldn't do stuff, I could certainly be. I could be present. I could be compassionate. I could hmm. be grateful, right. so, right. uh, you know, and so those are the things I think that are really important. Wow, it's beautiful, it's beautiful, I, okay, I don't even, I've got two questions, thank you so much for sharing that and for, for taking us on that journey with you, thank You're you. Welcome. You are a critic for seniors and housing, what does that entail? Well, I'm uh, certainly, I'm part of the official opposition caucus and uh, 
you know, previous to our most recent election, um, I was the minister of seniors and housing. Yes, you were. So um, uh, that's an area that I, you know, for the last three and a half years, had worked extensively in to make sure that seniors were supported, that we had the affordable housing we need, and uh, so you know, it was, it's really a decision of. The premier made me the minister of seniors and housing, so that was Premier Rachel Notley, yeah. and now the leader uh, of the official opposition, Rachel Notley. So you know, it's her decision that uh, you know I think this would be a good portfolio for you, Lori. And uh, so I was honored to be offered it, and I'm very happy and honored to be the critic because I feel like I know that area because of my experience. I am a social worker by profession, and so. Even though I did never worked with the seniors population through my 30-year career, uh -huh. uh, you know, because I have some expertise in in uh, social service area, a lot of the you know questions that you'd ask or uh, you know what the barriers people have to functioning well in society are similar, just with a bit of a different flavor. Yeah. So I was grateful for uh, the opportunity, and still am. And I feel like I, you know, I have a a uh, good understanding and uh, I'm happy. We know we have a, you know, a growing seniors population. We have over 600,000 seniors in, in our province and we're going to soon have, well, you know, it's going to grow dramatically because we're living longer, healthier lives. And the thing is about seniors, and this is one of the things I always like to say, is that, you know, seniors are uh, amazing folks who contribute significantly to our communities. And this kind of negative discourses that talks about the grave tsunami or you know the apocalyptic discourses <laughs> is some of the words I've heard uh, that seniors are such a burden I, it's it's mostly mythical of course people need supports and, yeah. and that's important but gosh you know these are the pioneers in our communities oftentimes they're still political leaders they're still community yeah. leaders there's yeah. leaders in their family and who's got the money the seniors, the seniors absolutely <laughs> so then then they share it just, so. a, just a quick one still on seniors do you feel we treat them po poorly our seniors do we treat them poorly is that what you find or we treat them okay in the society as a society treat? well like with everything we can always do do more i mean it's yeah. it's kind of uh, it's a tough one to say, like, we do this or that, because I think that there's a variance, you know, there's not, uh, we can't super generalize about that. I think there is certainly, uh, you know, like if we think about long-term care where people are very vulnerable and they need, you know, 24-hour service and support, and uh, sometimes they're in the hospital for longer periods of time because we don't have long-term care beds I think that that's not a good service to seniors for yeah. sure that's an area that you know we need to do more work and certainly when we were government we created 2,000 spaces and we had a commitment to do that once again you know when we were government mm -hmm. again but uh, now we have a different government and uh, we're not sure what they're going to do about that area yeah. so uh, so so for sure there's much more that we can do one of the things I'm very proud of is we have like over a hundred housing management bodies and so the, these are sort of the public delivery of affordable housing in communities all across Alberta. We have an amazing lodge system where seniors live in lodges and even in my little small town of Valley View there's a, a little lodge that's really a, you know a hub in the community and uh, people get to live you know they may have lived in the country and then you know maybe a spouse died and they don't want to be out there by themselves anymore they want to be connected mm. and uh, maybe they need some support and things like that so now you know in little communities even like a small town like Valley View there's a lodge there and there's lodges all across uh, our province I, I'm really proud of what uh, our system is doing to support uh, seniors in those facilities. So I know you're very busy. How then are you able to combine MLA duties, being a mom, a critic, with uh, bacon with Auntie Beth's recipe? <laughs> <laughs> oh yes, Auntie Beth. Well, you know, oh, so many years ago. How are you able to yeah. do all her baked goods to the farmer's market in yeah. Viking? This is another small town in Alberta, <laughs> sort of right. central Alberta. And she'd make 10 of those cakes in a day. Hmm. 
and then she'd sell them at the farmer's market. And that was only one thing. She'd make pies, and she oh. was just, like, extraordinary. Oh. And uh, so it was her little entrepreneur uh, thing to do. And she was just such a love... And she still is. She's she's my Auntie Beth. She, she lives in Camrose now. And she... Um, you know, contributed so much to the community, and this was her kind of little thing that she and she loved to bake. Mm, There's mm, nothing she could mm. make; she could make croissants. Oh. She would like just teach herself to do all these yeah, things. She yeah. that was her passion, really. And I sort of got a little uh, taste of that just by hanging out with her. <laughs> and uh, so I'm right in no no mm -hmm. way uh, as uh, extraordinary as her in that department. Oh. But I just do it once in well, a while. You passed. We, we we gave that our team gave that a take. <laughs> it was all very well done. Thank you so yeah. much. We love you. Thank you for your time. And then um, we hope we can do this again. All right, then. Thanks, everyone, for watching. Bye.